Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Spencer Stone. He's a U.S. Air Force veteran who earned international recognition after he and two of his friends stopped a terrorist attack on a train in France back in 2015. In 2018, they also starred in the movie depicting that event titled The 1517 to Paris. Spencer joins me today just hours before he and Alex Garlatos and Anthony Sadler serve as Grand Marshals for the National Memorial Day Parade. And Spencer, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thanks for having me. Where were you born and raised? I was uh, born and raised in Sacramento, California. And what was that like? That, uh, I mean, it was good, you know. Sacramento's a, it's a nice city. Uh, it's, you know, it's the capital of California. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes just living there, you forget that it's the capital, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, like, realize how, and, then, and you don't realize until you get older how much of a government, government town mm -hmm. it is. Uh, but Sacramento's a, a unique place because it's, it's very diverse. Uh, you can pretty much get any type of culture you want there, uh, believe it or not. And uh, it's, uh, it's the type of city, it's a, it's a big city, but it feels like a small town because, I mean, everywhere you go, you, you see someone you know. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's, it's got a kind of cool, weird dynamic to it. I don't know, it's all over the place. Big Kings fan? Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge Kings fan. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm not. I'm just not. I, and, okay. you know, people, they, of course, they assume I'm a Golden State warrior bandwagoner. But okay. I've been following Golden State since, like, Baron Davis was on the team. Okay. So, a long, long time ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that paid off for you. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, except that no one believes me. So. <laughs> uh, when did you meet uh, Alec and Anthony? Uh, I met Alec when I was five years old. Uh, he moved in next door. I actually hated him at first <laughs> because he <laughs> was uh, him and his brothers were throwing rocks on my mom's lawn. I was like, who are these new people throwing <laughs> rocks in our lawn? Disrespectful. <laughs> but no. Uh, but yeah, so met when we were five, uh, our moms became, they were both, you know, uh, divorced, at the, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. And so they just kind of like, you know, had three, he had, she had three boys. My mom, you know, two boys, one girl, so kind of like similar situation. They just bonded and became really good friends, and they're still friends, great friends to this day. They still live next door to each other. Same houses? Same houses. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and then I met a Anthony uh, when I was in junior high, and so collectively uh, we've all three been friends since we were about like 12 years old. How'd you bond with Anthony? What was the, what was the key? I know it's in the movie, but... Uh well, uh, I would say just like a mutual hate for the school we went to <laughs> because uh, it was like this kind of weird private Christian school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I'm religious, you know, I, you know, I believe in God. And, but I mean, this place was just pretty strict. Pretty. Yeah, it was like a little overboard. And uh, so we just like naturally, I guess, kind of rebelled against the school because <clears throat> they kind of just the the types to involve themselves in your lives too much so i would say honestly that was our bonding factor that we were just in a place that we hated and we were like the only ones in the school that really hated it that much <laughs> so that was just our, our our bonding thing and then of course we played basketball mm -hmm. uh we we're on the same basketball team and you know played a bunch played a bunch of sports together but you know just we just clicked yeah, it got pretty funny in the movie with all the recurring scenes in the principal's office. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we definitely definitely got in trouble a lot, for sure. <laughs> and, yeah, mostly to our after-school activities as well. Nothing crazy, just, like, doorbell ditching people's houses on the weekend, uh, TPing people's houses, you know, just, like, little kid stuff. Nothing destructive. Nothing, just, nothing crazy. Just annoying. Yeah, we did have <laughs> someone pull a gun on us one time, but... Really? Yeah, but that was... Uh, we were doorbell, well, I don't blame him, though. So we were doorbell ditching his house until, like, 3 in the morning, just, like, over and over and over again, like, from midnight to 3. We would just go hide in the bush and wait for him to come out, and then he obviously caught us, but he was just scaring us. Okay. Yeah, I won't report him. <laughs> um, when did you decide to join the Air Force, and why did you decide to join the Air Force? Uh, I just... Decided to join the Air Force. Well, I pretty much made the decision when I, about six months after high school, so, you know, 18 and a half or so. Um, and I originally joined because 
I mean, honestly, through high school, I just hadn't applied myself at all, really. Uh, and, like, I didn't even, like, know how to sign up for my you know, community college or, or anything like that. So <clears throat> I just kind of realized how much I kind of just wasted, like, the first 18 years of my life. And so I wanted to just do something kind of, like, crazy overboard to get, I guess, in a way, make up for it for myself and, like, for my family. Uh, you know, my mom sacrificed a lot for me and my brother and my sister and, uh, like, kind of just gave up a lot of the things that she wanted in her own life to give us the life we had. Mm-hmm. So I also kind of feel like I, like, I owed it to her to do something. And so I was just like, hey, I found out about this program, Pararescue, and uh, sounded pretty crazy to me. It was like, you know, basically like the Navy SEALs of the Air Force. And uh, so I, you know, and, and also you get your paramedics license. And my plan after the military, I always knew that I was just going to do one contract in the military no matter what I did. Mm-hmm. And because I wanted to go out and be a paramedic firefighter. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I said, you know, hey, oh, this would be crazy. I'll get to go to war, you know, and do like just crazy stuff. And I'll get my paramedics license. I'll get really you know, a lot of good experience, and I'll be a shoe in for firefighting afterwards, and this is just something I've always wanted to do, uh, so I'm going to go do it, And but I, you know, of course, had to lose a, a bunch of weight, get in good shape, I went from doing, like, zero pull-ups to being able to do, like, 15, mm. uh, and then, obviously, and then all the other calisthenic work and running, I had to dro- I dropped, like, 60 pounds, 50, 50 60 pounds, uh, so and then I trained for, like, a year. Uh, and then I joined the Air Force when I was 20. And then if I remember correctly from the movie, there was a written test that became a problem, correct? I, it was a depth perception. Depth perception, that's Yeah. Right. So when, it, when I went to the process, MEPS, the processing center, uh, they, you know, you go through all different types of tests. But when I took the depth perception test, I guess I have no depth perception, uh, which I, I kind of don't believe because I think their machine is, is outdated. <laughs> but... Uh, but yeah, so that disqualified me, and then <clears throat> basically at that point, I was pretty devastated because uh, I, I just felt like I never had worked so hard for something, kind of right. like felt like I was going in the right direction, and then for it just to be that like kind of cut off like that, I was like, you know, that's confusing, and uh, so I got pushed into this program called SEER, stands for Survival, Evasion, uh, Resistance, and Escape. They train uh, other special forces, and uh, like. Uh, what, what, I want to think trying to get a word that like aircraft crew uh, to in case they ever get shot down or captured by the yeah. enemy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so was going into that, and then I failed out of that, and then uh, got uh, put into the medical technician program, which I was like super happy with, you know, because it's I wanted to be medical, so mm-hmm. it kind of all ended up working out. And it, I think in the end, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but. Uh, it seemed like I was being denied the things I wanted and then pushed into the direction that I needed, you know, obviously for what has transpired through right. my life now. Yeah. So Exactly. Yeah. What, what are some of the different places you were stationed in the Air Force? Uh, so I was in San Antonio for about a year. Um, and then I was in Las Vegas for six weeks. Uh, that was fun. Uh, turned 21 there, so <laughs> that was good timing. And then... Uh, and I actually got stationed at Travis Air Force Base, which was 45 minutes away from Sacramento. And, you know, but when I joined the Air Force, uh, I never left the state of California. So I, that was a big part of why I wanted to join, too, is for traveling. Mm-hmm. And then just to get stationed right back at home <laughs> kind of sucked. But, I, like, actually, it was, ended up working out pretty well. Um, but then from there, I went to uh, the Azores, uh, Lodges Field. Uh, it's a Portuguese air base, uh, basically in the middle of the ocean, uh, which is which was awesome. You know, it was like Hawaii with no tourism, uh, and I was there. And then the terrorist attack happened, and then uh, for the rest of my contract, I was stationed uh, at Travis again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any opportunities to put that medical training uh, to work prior to the train? No, not really. Yeah, no, I never like come across a situation where I I needed to. Uh, it did afterwards. After the train, seemed like it kept popping up, like where I could use it. Like I even like on a flight home from DC. Uh, really? Yeah, like some some guy was like freaking out on the airplane, 
and uh, he, I'm pretty sure he was on drugs though, and uh, I basically just like calmed him down. But like I, I remember just like one one moment, I was like on the phone with the pilot, and, really? I, and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, isn't there anyone? A little, in my, I'm thinking in my head, like, isn't there anyone a little bit more experienced that should be talking to the pilot right now? And he's like, do you think we need to divert? Like, is he going to be okay? I'm like, I don't know. Like, you're going to put this man's life in my hands? Like, I'm just an EMT, bro. Like, so, but he ended up just sleeping the whole way, and then uh, we made it back to Sacramento. But, yeah, other than the terrorist attack, that was the only other time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, talk about the, the decision to go to Europe as a just on a trip you and Anthony spent most of the trip together and then you eventually met up with Alec correct yeah uh so I was kind of like planning the trip uh at first uh and I was gonna just go solo like if it came down to it like I didn't care uh and then I knew then I realized like oh Alec's gonna be you know coming off his deployment soon and and then Anthony's graduating soon and I was like I'm gonna hit him up and then uh, you know, Alec wanted to stay in Germany uh, to visit his uh, German uh, girlfriend. I don't, I don't know, like, you know what they are, but like, uh, but like he knew her from from somewhere. So I was like, all right, go ahead, you know, visit with her. And then uh, me and Anthony just wanted to go everywhere, and so, but Alec just wanted to stay in like one country for a long time, mm -hmm. and so me and Anthony started in Rome, met up in Rome. Then went to Venice, Munich, uh, Berlin, and then obviously after Berlin, uh, went to Amsterdam and met up with Alec, mm -hmm. and then everything happened. So, all right, Spencer, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Spencer Stone on Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Honored to be joined today by Spencer Stone, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. He and his two friends, uh, well known now for stopping a terrorist attack on a train in France in 2015. They starred as themselves in the movie The 1517 to Paris in 2018, and today, Memorial Day 2018, the three of them are Grand Marshals for the National Memorial Day Parade. So we'll talk about that <coughs> in a little bit. But Spencer, we led right up to the point where you boarded the train here in Amsterdam mm -hmm. going to Paris. So what were you doing on the train when you first realized something was wrong? Uh, I was actually asleep. Um, so the way it's situated is there was two seats on, on the left side of the train and there was the aisle and there was a single seat across the way so kind of three all in a line uh, and then you know, I was in the aisle seat Anthony was on the other side of the train and then Alec was against the window and me and Anthony both fell asleep and Alec was on his phone and Ayub the terrorist was in the train oh not in in the in the corridor uh, where the bathroom and the luggage departments are mm -hmm. And so he's in the bathroom and he's watching extremist videos on his phone, getting himself pumped up, beheadings, shootings, things like that. He comes out of the bathroom and there's two guys waiting to go, one by the name of Mark McGallion, uh, and then the other, uh, call him Damien, that's his uh, kind of alias. He wants to remain anonymous because he lives in Paris. Mm. Uh, and so they kind of get into an initial scuffle. Um, Mark is able to take the AK from him and then, uh, then I think a train employee gets involved as well. And then he sees like all the guns. I think he was trying to break it up at first because he thought it was just a regular fight. And then once he got in the middle of it and he saw the AK and everything, he was like, oh, you know, like this is not like regular, you know, obviously. And then he kind of takes off into our train. And then after he comes in, Mark comes in, uh, but Ayub was able to throw Damien to the ground and kind of knock him out, I think, and then pulled out the pistol. As he pulled out the pistol, he dropped the magazine out of the pistol, and so he only has one round in the chamber, and then he shot Mark in the back. Uh, the bullet ricocheted around his body, broke two ribs, collapsed his left lung, came up through his neck, and then severed his carotid artery, and actually flew over me and Alex's heads and broke this uh, emergency glass hammer that was in front of us. And then so, so the commotion of the train employees, what actually woke me up, because I had like noise canceling headphones on, I uh, was knocked out already anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, him running by, I was like, whoa, like why is he running like that? And then I took my headphones off and then I heard the glass breaking. And, but I didn't know that was what was breaking at the time. I thought it was, I thought it was coming from behind me. Uh. And then uh, 
Then I heard people screaming. And then I turn around. The first thing I see is IU coming in and picking up the AK off the ground from where Mark Mark left it, uh, and just just loading around into it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, like this is happening. Like I like recognized it like right away. I mean. Even just kind of looked like a cliche terrorist of a movie, to be honest. Like he's shirtless, he has a backpack strapped to the front of him. You can see the magazines like sticking out. He's holding an AK-47. I'm like you know, I wonder what this could be, you know, like. <laughs> uh, and so I look down the aisle and I kind of see that he's like fumbling with it, and like I, I thought maybe he like short stroked the the AK and jammed it or something. And so I was like, okay, you know, this is like a moment, like we need to go right now. And I'm kind of like thinking that in my head. And then Alec hits me on the shoulder and he says like, go Spencer. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> what are you thinking when I'm he says like, that? Like, this is oh, an AK-47 like, down there. I had to, like, no matter what, I had to get up first. You know, I'm in the aisle. Uh-huh. So it's all good. Uh, <laughs> figured he could just use me as a shield in case things didn't work out. But I mean, I didn't think I was going to make it to him anyway. So, yeah. uh, I, th- I thought we were all going to die. And so I, I run up at him and I kind of like blacked out or I closed my eyes. I'm not sure. Um, but I just remember like hearing him mess with the gun and then pulling the trigger. Uh, and then when I made it to him, it was like a big surprise, you know, obviously. But I guess when I was running up at him, he uh, pulled the trigger, uh, but it was a bad primer in the bullet, uh, well, in the, in the case. And so, you know, it was just a dud, faulty wow. ammunition. And then, uh, so I gave me enough time, made it to him. We're wrestling on the ground a little bit. I get him into, a, I practice jujitsu uh, a little bit here and there. And so I put him in a rear naked choke, threw myself against the train. And I'm, so I'm kind of like on his back at this point. And then he pulls out a box cutter. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. He pulled out the pistol first. And uh, he, uh, you know, he used the only round that he had, thank goodness. And so, so I give credit to Mark. He, you know, I give him credit for saving our lives. He took the the bullet, you know, and without him causing that kind of like initial disturbance without you, I don't think we would have been in the place to even, you know, do something in mm-hmm. the first place. So, he reaches back, tries to shoot me with that, doesn't go off. Uh, at that point, Alec runs up, basically, and grabs the pistol out of his hands, and then he pulls the box cutter out. And then he starts like slashing the back of my neck, like basically trying to like slit my throat. Uh, and then comes across and cuts my thumb to the bone, severed my tendon and nerve. Uh, and I didn't feel my neck. It kind of like burned a little bit, but I didn't realize he was stabbing me. And uh, then I, once I saw my hand though, I was like, oh, you know, like how'd that happen? And I look over his shoulder and I see him like just flinging the box cutter around. And, uh, and I screamed like, oh, he's got a knife, he's got a knife, get him off me kicked him off me and now he's in, we're all in the middle of the aisle me anthony and alec are all surrounding him we're all like getting punches in kicking him, doing whatever we can do because that was like i <clears throat> we had kind of like a moment where it was like the first time no one had a gun in their hands or like a weapon in general and so we just like looked at each other and we're like oh, okay like let's like beat him up i guess you know <laughs> and uh so then he kind of got pushed into me or he like lunged at me I'm not sure and then i just kind of like used his momentum and like threw him over this table and then now we're all three kind of on top of him holding him down over the table and then alec tried to he took the pistol you know we told them told him stop resisting stop resisting you know he, he was still like flailing everywhere we didn't know if he had any other weapons on him or what so we tried to shoot him with this with his own handgun uh, but obviously it was empty so i tried to shoot him twice didn't work then we threw it and then threw him in the choke and then uh, choked him out. And it was like, you know, huh, thank God, you know. It's like the longest two minute fight of our lives. Incredible. Yeah. Spencer, let's take one more break and we'll come right back and conclude your story. Just a moment. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Karumbas, honored to be joined today by Spencer Stone, U.S. Air Force veteran, who, along with his friends Anthony Sadler and Alex Scarlato, stopped a terrorist attack on a train going from Amsterdam to Paris in 2015. Uh, Spencer, you've described this fight in vivid detail in the, in the previous segment. So mm-hmm. what, do you, what finally comes to mind once the adrenaline starts to drop a little bit after this encounter? I don't think the adrenaline went away for a few days, to be wow. honest. Uh, 
and it was kind of like the I've never obviously we've never experienced like this surge of of adrenaline before, but it was pretty crazy. I mean, it was almost like a feeling of euphoria, like uh, I'd never felt like so clear headed in my entire life, uh, and like calm, mm-hmm. and almost as if like I was just very unaffected at the time, like. Uh, we were all like, all three of us, like kind of like very cavalier about everything that was going on around us. Uh, and I don't think it was, I don't think we truly registered like what, what had happened until like at least a few days, if not weeks later. Wow. Yeah. Alec was telling us a little while ago that you guys were pretty much the only security on the train until it got to the next station. Pretty that? much, yeah. I mean, uh, that was kind of cool thing about film in the movie is that uh, you know we found out a lot more stuff uh, about what everyone else was doing at the time and uh, they I don't know if they want me to say it but I don't really care but uh, <laughs> basically the train employees uh, that left earlier uh, they they kind of went and I guess like locked themselves in this like safe room and uh, I guess and then there was a famous French actor on the train who had hit the emergency stop uh, for the train. So the train slowed down and came to a stop. Mm -hmm. And I guess then those employees jumped off the train, ran across a field, hopped a fence, and then caught a cab and and like left. And so (laughs) so I just think it was kind of funny. But yeah, like we were literally like, we were like running the train uh, for like the next 30, 40 minutes. So it was was pretty, pretty wild. What was it like to be, let me back up, I'll ask that one in a second. When did you realize just how much attention the story was getting? Not until, because I mean, I got kind of swept away like by the ambulance, and so I got separated from Anthony and Alec pretty quick, <clears throat> and uh, didn't see them for like over twenty four hours, uh, and like for the first, I would say twelve, sixteen hours, uh, I was the only English speaking person around me, so uh, I didn't really understand you know like i knew it was a big deal like i knew i knew once even when we were on the train like i knew like we stopped terrorists like i would I register that but i didn't register how big it was going to be i thought it was going to be like a little blurb on the news and then it would move on to some some other tragedy you uh-huh. know uh but so i was actually watching well i was in kind of like the intensive care unit i guess and uh it was past midnight and then the nurses that were watching after me came in my room and they were like, Oh, like you're, you're on, you're on the news. And I'm like, Oh really? And they're like, yeah. And then they invited me, uh, into their break room. And I was just, I mean, it was French television, so I didn't understand what they were saying, but like my picture was on the news and I was like, <laughs> oh, Wow, this is a big deal. And then once I was at the, the other hospital the next day, cause I got uh, surgery on my hand, mm-hmm. uh, and there was like paparazzi like all like running around the hotel they're like telling me like stay away from the windows because they don't want to like take pictures of me uh, and then like they're trying to like find which room i'm in and i'm like what the heck is you know like this is crazy <laughs> and then the embassy people got there and then, like the first thing they said when they walked in the room was like oh we got the president of the united states gonna be calling in 10 minutes like be ready and i'm like what like you know like what is going on and then from there just like came full realization you know like of like wow this is a really big deal yeah you know wow. like i knew it was a big deal but i didn't think the world would care <laughs> yeah so what was a bigger deal getting a call from the president of the united states or having clint eastwood tell you he was interested in your story <sighs> i mean both i mean i don't, think, <laughs> I don't think there's so many awesome things that's happened to us that you can't really compare one one to right. the other you know so like they're cool in their own regard uh obviously a call from any president is like you know an honor sure. uh and, but uh yeah if i had to pick one sorry uh president obama but <laughs> taking taking clint eastwood because he made the movie so right. <laughs> unless you're gonna make a movie i know he just signed some netflix deal so <laughs> yeah, he might be calling you again yeah. we'll see. <laughs> um so from what alec told us is he said, send me the book, because you guys wrote a book together. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, then, and then he'd finally got back to you, and all of a sudden there's a movie about to happen with this. 
Yeah, it kind of, you know, it was like the weakest sales pitch ever. Uh, when we said it, we were just like, hey, you know, we said it like jokingly at an award show. Like, you should make a movie on it. So like, as we knew this is what he does. This is like, you know, his alley, you know, real life stories. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, send me the book. You never know what can happen. And then sent him a book. Actually didn't hear anything from him for a few months. And I, so I figured just wasn't interested. And then uh, I was sending books out to like a lot of my favorite uh, directors and things like that and letters trying to get the, the rights sold. And then uh, I basically was just like, I'm just gonna send him another one. Like, why not? I have his address. And then I wrote him a letter with it this time. And so I must have messed up the address or something like that or just didn't make it to him. And then once I sent that book, uh, like three days later he called us. So it was like almost a missed opportunity too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So what's your reaction when, he fi when you find out not only does he want to do the movie, mm -hmm. he wants you guys to star in it. Yeah, that was something we never saw coming, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we even like our friends and family would be like, oh, like are you going to play yourselves in the movie? And we're like, like now dude like you know, we want the movie to be successful like of course we're not going to play ourselves in the movie like uh and but then you know once he called us down and presented it to us we were like you know he he heck yes and like obviously like we will we would love to play ourselves but but it was it was crazy just like totally blindsided by because like one making a movie with clint eastwood on your life is one thing but then when he asked you to star in it it's like you know, he didn't, you know, it's like a blessing, like a gift. I was almost just like, why? Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> I don't understand it. So is it a little odd to get advice on how to play yourself from a director? Uh, I mean, he never gave, really gave us advice on how to play ourselves. Okay. I mean, he barely even directed us, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, he directed us, but, like, he mostly just would say, like, his direction is just do it how it happened. Okay. And do it, you know, how you remember it. And, you know, like, see, like even when it came to the script and the dialogue, we're like, very free to say what we want. You know, we could change it if we wanted to. Like, a lot, of, we did a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Just change the dialogue to make it, we keep the context of the scene, but just change things to make it sound like us, sound like a natural conversation. And so he would just do that. And so it really is, like, the freedom he gave us to uh, do whatever was, was the direction. I think. Fantastic. So yeah. what was the release like? Uh, crazy, because we went on this like world tour for like a month, month and a half. And literally like, you know, new city every day, new, ci new city every couple of days or so. I remember in like a 24 hour period, we went from Washington DC to Norfolk, Virginia, and then Atlanta. And so we had done press in all three cities within t a 24 hour period. Wow. So we were, just exhausted but it was like you know obviously like time of our lives as well you know yeah, absolutely an opportunity yeah. that yeah and when are you going to go on a world <laughs> world tour to promote your movie right. you know so you can find the energy for that right yeah exactly oh we, we man. manned up <laughs> um what was it like <laughs> when you had to reenact the scene on the train uh just pretty fun honestly people think you know it's like we're gonna like they, I think a few people were concerned we're like we're gonna have like a freak out on the train or something, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we've done a good job of taking something that I guess that was negative or is viewed as negative uh, and turned it into a positive for us. You know, because the good thing about our story is that no one died. You right. know, we didn't even kill a terrorist, mm -hmm. uh, so th there's not that factor in it. And so I think we're able to look back on it as actually more of a fond memory, believe it or not, okay. uh, than anything else. Uh, and then remaking the scene. I mean, there was one moment where I kind of had like a flashback, like a true flashback was with Mark. Because Mark, you know, played himself. A lot of people played themselves in the movie, not just us. Okay. And uh, it, we were doing the scene of where he's bleeding out. And I was over there, you know, with like my hand in his neck. And... Uh, it was like, you know, we're wearing the same clothes uh, that we were wearing. You know, it was like the same amount of blood. It looked exactly the same. Uh, it, it's Mark, you know, his wife, Issa, is right there. Mm -hmm. And we're saying the same exact things we said to each other on the day of. We're on the train going from Amsterdam to Paris. And so it's just like I completely forgot that anyone was even there when we were doing the scene. 
and then I just remember they said cut, and I was like, remember saying to myself in my head, like, oh, like, there's like people in the room, oops, <laughs> and like, uh, and then I looked up and then saw Clint Eastwood, uh, his face, and uh, I just remember his facial expression was like, 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 I just, I, 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 I guess I can't even really describe it, but everyone behind him had the same facial expression. And I just looked up and everyone was like, oh, you know, that was real. That was real. Like that's what, that's what happened. And there's like this weird energy through the train, so kind of a kind of a weird trippy moment, for sure. Where's the terrorist? Is he? I assume he's in prison. Yeah, okay. he's in French custody. Okay. Uh, and I think, I don't really know what's gonna happen with that uh, because I guess he just released a new statement, kind of admitting uh, guilt. I think he was like, uh, you know, holding his story of that he found the guns and ammunition in a park and it was robbing us for food uh, for a while. But I think he's like recently broke and uh so i don't know if we're still gonna go to trial or what but yeah he's in french custody for now when did you decide to leave the air force uh i mean as soon as i got in <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh i mean that and like i said before you know that was my plan that was my plan all along yeah uh i wanted to serve in the military my entire life but i knew that that wasn't I guess something I wanted to do for 20 years uh, mm-hmm. or more, and so my decision to get out of the military was much before any of this had happened, mm-hmm. and so I and I believe that if I if I would have stayed in the military, I probably would have done it for the wrong reasons. Uh, I don't think I would have been doing it for my own happiness, you know, because I was being treated very well. I got promoted to staff sergeant, uh, and you know I was like the poster boy or face of the Air Force for a while. And so, I don't know, just kind of like a weird feeling. Mm-hmm. Not something I guess I really wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, would have felt like a phony if I would have stayed in. What are you doing now? Uh, well, now that we, you know, got the, the acting opportunity, that was like the funnest two months of my life making the film. <laughs> so if I could get some more acting roles, I would love to do that and make it a career. So pursuing that right now, I got an acting agent. I got a bunch of agents, so I've gone full Hollywood. Nice. Right now, and, uh, and so doing that, I do a lot of public speaking now. So I go out and speak to universities or companies or whichever, and, you know, tell my story and what I've learned from it and other things or whatever they want me to speak on. And uh, and then also uh, hopefully going to be uh, having my own TV show pretty, really? pretty soon. Yeah. What's that going to be like? Like uh, basic, <laughs> basically it's uh, be a show based off of uh, – people who have done great things but never been recognized okay. and so it'd be like a giving back oh that's type fantastic thing. yeah that's fantastic in, in doing the research for this i realized you also survived a serious attack here in the united states oh yeah yeah and you almost lost your life yeah that was worse than the terrorist attack uh I was declared a homicide before i even got to the hospital stabbed in the heart my lung liver about an inch and a half away from my spinal cord uh, so I was almost paralyzed. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty crazy. Uh, basically, long story short, I was out with some old friends, and uh, one of the girls I was with, we were out drinking, you know, and uh, one of the girls was sick, so she was like throwing up on the sidewalk, and then so I'm um, with her, and then her two other girls, and then another guy that I had just met that night, he was a new boyfriend of a girl I'm with, <coughs> was going to get the car and pull it around. So as I'm waiting for him to pull around, uh, five dudes walked by. They ended up being part of this Asian gang called Hop Singh, and they ran out of San Francisco. Kind of like they kind of like run all of Chinatown, I guess. Uh, but uh, they came by and they started messing with her, like Snapchatting her, trying like the phone light in her face. And so I, at first I was like, you know, like, hey, get out of here! What are you doing? Stop that! And then things just escalated from there. And you know, the girls I'm, the other girls I'm with, got up in the guy's face, started yelling. Then out of nowhere, you know, like cause at this point, I'm realizing, you know, five guys, me, and two girls, and like things are getting pretty heated. So I'm like, okay, I need to like de-escalate this because yeah. I'm not about to fight five people, like, and I don't want to fight anyway. And uh, so I'm like pushing one of my friends back. And out of nowhere, the guy that like, kind of reaches over me, and then uh, punches the girl I'm with in the face, and then uh, tries to stab her as well. Uh, I didn't see the knife at that time. Like she got poked a little bit with the knife, 
but then, but as soon as I saw her get punched, I just turned around and started, started fighting them, and then it turned into a five on one, and they stabbed me four, four times, and then I had an emergency. Luckily, ambulance was right around the corner, so I was like a six minute ride to a level one trauma center, and uh, had emergency open heart surgery, exploratory surgery in my stomach, bilateral chest tubes. Uh, it was pretty crazy. Uh, they didn't think I'd survive, but here I am. How do you so. feel now? Feel good. Yeah? Yeah. Feel Fully great. recovered. Yeah, pretty much. Outstanding. Thank God. Uh, last question. What does it mean to you to be a Grand Marshal today? Uh, it means a lot, you know, to uh, be recognized in this way, I guess. Uh, it's not something, you know, like we don't view ourselves as, as being that important. So mm -hmm. <laughs> when other people, you know, think that it's an honor for to come be in their parade and kind of be the grand marshal uh it's something that always is like hum very humbling for us and uh we're just honored to be here and you know we know the parade's gonna be fun but you know the real reason is to honor the men and the women that have died uh protecting our country and giving us the, the our way of life absolutely well said spencer thank you for your service to our country you and your friends saved a lot of lives on that train uh, that day so we thank, thank you. you for that and thanks for your time today appreciate it thank you i'm greg Corumbus. this is veterans chronicles